Hello, everyone. Welcome to Ten Ian's Corner and another uh, discussion. I'm Dan, Jesse's brother. You're probably familiar with me from other uh, After Hours screen talks. Having said that, we're not talking about a movie or a TV show today. We're going to be talking about a series of comic books, Wendy and Richard Penny's ElfQuest. One of the formative experiences that we both had with uh, the genre or subgenre of high fantasy. I highly recommend it as a work of high fantasy. I'll set it up with just about anything in American literature, American pop culture. We're going to be talking about Wendy and Richard Penny's, well, really, especially Wendy Penny's world building, her artistry. Uh, but we also want to talk about the characters. And I think uh, there are five central characters, certainly, uh, that we want to discuss. And they are obviously the ElfQuest protagonist, Cutter, chief of the Wolf Riders, his uh, second in command and his blood brother, Skywise, his partner, Lita, who is um, actually a, a magical character. She is a healer. There is the series central antagonist, Winnowill, and then the series central anti hero, Rayek. Those five figures are the central figures of the stories, in my view. The uh, Wolf Riders, they are the, the first tribe of elves that we get introduced to. The fundamental event that kicks off the very first graphic novel is that uh, the Wolf Riders are burnt out of their ancestral home, the Halt, by um, religious fanatic humans who regard them as demons. The Wolf Rider's chief, Cutter, who is the story's central protagonist, he and one of the Sunfolk people, Lita, who is also a central character, fall in love with each other. And this becomes the kind of stimulating event for Cutter to realize that there's there are more elves out there. So he undertakes uh, a quest to try and find more elves. The the germ for this, in addition to the discovery of the Sunfolk, is the notion of the High Ones. The High Ones are the legendary semi-parent figures that the, the Wolf Riders are aware of as a matter of legend, as a matter of myth. And they actually meet elves in uh, the Sunfolk tribe who resemble High Ones and are actually much older than they are. Um, and in fact, the Sunfolk are immortal like the original elves were, like the original High Ones. The Wolf Riders are not. They're long-lived, but they're not immortal. So that's the basic setup. Jesse, what uh, what's that sound to you when you think about ElfQuest and your thoughts about it? Well, as you mentioned, what stands out to begin with was that it was a <laughs> very much a, a shared childhood experience between us growing up. It was one of the first comics. I would put X-Men there, too. But definitely, I think in terms of immersiveness, immersing ourselves in a comic book world, universe, inhabiting that world and those characters, falling in love with it as a shared experience between us, like we just bonded over that that series. And just as a bit of context, and this has come up in my previous videos about ElfQuest, and I got some of the chronology of the publication history wrong, but we came to ElfQuest when it was put together in graphic novel form in like the mid to late eighties, I believe. Yeah, right there. Yeah, those books, those are the originals we have. They were beautifully recolored or colored because originally ElfQuest was in black and white. It was first uh, serialized and published in comic book form in I think 1979, Wendy and Richard Penny. Although I think their last name is pronounced Penny. Penny. <laughs> Right. I, think, I think so. Don't quote me on that. It makes me laugh. Yeah. <laughs> they uh, had trouble like uh, selling it to the big publishers like Marvel DC. No one would take it. So they made their own independent comic book publishing company, Warp Comics, W-A-R-P, which stands for Wendy, Wendy and Richard P Penny. And so that's how it came ElfQuest came about, uh, one of the first like big successful indie comics and just a coming of age experience for the two of us. And so enthralling, just the level, the large canvas it works in, the vast uh, world, vast cast of characters it was just mesmerizing. Wendy Penny's like just beautiful character designs and uh, pencil work, ink work, and she did it all, into, including like scripting it. I mean, incredible. And also like made history as one of the first like major female comic book writers and artists. Like, I mean, they both did 
incredible work on the series, but Richard Penny really handled, handled like the publishing marketing end of it. And so mm. pretty much the scripting, the penciling, the inking, you know, the cover art, all that, like she was doing that herself. I mean, wow. And remarkable and achievement. Remarkable. And also just the writing is terrific. I mean, not only are the drawings and illustrations at a visual level incredible, but just the writing is so well done. I mean, the characters are so well fleshed out. As a kid, I very much related to Cutter, pretty much because I thought he was really cool. He was a, a multi-layered hero character, you know, a great fighter, a great hunter and, and swordsman, and he pursued the path of nonviolence often. So that immediately makes him kind of a more kind of interesting character too. Skywise was also a personal favorite. I loved his book. You know, Cutter was very kind of earthly, worldly, and grounded, and Skywise had his, well, I mean, like Skywise, his head in the clouds. Uh, so they were a perfect pair, and their bromance is so well done. And also uh, in some of the comments I got from those Elfquest videos, a lot of folks love Skywise. <laughs> He's a popular character, and I understand why, because yeah. I definitely... I think at one point he was my favorite character as a kid, uh, both Cutter and Skywise. Yeah, no, I, I think that the storytelling is phenomenal. I wanted to ask you what you think about um, Wendy Penny's, uh, or I guess I guess Penny's um, world building. What do you think about what you notice rereading the comics and and about how she is establishing that this really is a a world apart. The the world of two moons and these elf quest tribes they're not just simple analogs of, of of you know human formations human cultures they they seem to have their own kind of apartness and uniqueness um what struck you the most of, amongst the tribes obviously the wolf riders are central but what do you think uh the world itself uh, on a visual level like the forest world setting to the desert and then you have whole adventures that take place on the snow and the mountains. Each of those has such a immersive quality that you feel you're in those locations. I think too, like the tribes of the elves are very well established and drawn. They have such a sense of history and legacy, each one. Like the Sun Folk, they're agrarian society and they're healers. And then you have the wolf riders, you know, a hunter gatherer tribe, and then, you know, a bunch of other tribes. And Wendy and Richard Penny based those off, you know, our own human historical and cultural development too. And those kinds of parallels. Yeah, I agree. And I think it's a testament to just how much planning and thought went into the uh the look of the whole series, the the meticulous way that Wendy Penny uh designed and and then composed these characters you're talking about the sun folk i was struck going back over the stories especially with just how strikingly rounded and real the sun folk as a society seem i mean their dresses are strikingly different in appearance and design from of course what the wolf riders are wearing but also what when any of the other elf cultures we encounter are wearing and you really do get this sense that they've spent generations and generations in this area. And I, I feel that richness whenever we get introduced to a new tribe of elves. It always feels like they've been very carefully thought out and that, uh, you know, a story arc, a history has been designed and created for them. Uh, that that nothing was ever slapdash with, with Penny and the decisions she made and the work she did, you know, planning ahead and making sure that these characters seemed real. Yeah. And I will also say that part of the inspiration for the idea of Elf Quest was Star Wars. The success of Star Wars showed that there was this growing market for large scale epic fantasy storytelling. I think a common root for Star Wars and Elf Quest as well is this this appreciation of Joseph Campbell and the um the archetypes of Western mythology. Yeah. Um, that's something else we should certainly talk about is I think one yeah. of the things that makes it such a rich reading experience is that it's never just superficially pretty or superficially adventurous. There's always, it's always underpinned by these really kind of resonant moral parables and um, existential philosophical questions about being and about yeah. identity, time, history, myth, 
men and women, um, yeah. parents and children. Uh, yeah. you, you keep coming back sort of like, um, you know, I mean, I think there's a reason that The Lion King is one of my favorite Disney movies. You just feel this this closeness to these sort of like central myths and archetypal uh, character types um, that keep reoccurring. And the reason they keep reoccurring is because they don't stop resonating. Joseph Campbell, for those of you who don't know, was a comparative mythologist, very influential for George Lucas. And archetypes are recurring patterns found in the symbols, mythology, and art in human history and culture. These mythological figures, they had a psychological resonance. They were projections of like a spiritual and psychological process within ourselves. Wendy and Richard Penny actually referred to Joseph Campbell in a preface to the, I think, volume one of those colored editions. And they very much are self-aware about saying that ElfQuest is about archetypes because you discover that the High Ones, when their planet was dying, they had to leave and find other planets to inhabit. They were shapeshifters, able to take on different forms and acclimate to every environment they were in. They saw that humans, through their art and their myth and their symbols, you know, worshipped angels, you know, fairy-like beings and fairies in their mythological stories. So they take on the form of elves. These aliens thought, oh, let's take on the form of these myths. The high ones take on the semblance of a human mythic construct or ar archetype as a way to appeal to the human imagination. Like Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, it's, it's, it, you know, it exists because, uh, in the way that it does because of a carefully articulated origin story. Um, and I think the dramatic weight of the quest that Cutter undergoes to try and find other elves, it has the resonance it does because of that origin, this idea that at some point we were one, we were as we should be, and then we were separated, we were divided, we were destroyed, um, war warped out of our original forms. This idea of, of a kind of metaphysical oneness, this, this original authentic form, that has tremendous resonance. But what resonates even more for me, uh, as I think you were hinting at too, is the way that the characters dramatize different r human philosophical, moral, and ethical responses to this fundamental qu question of identity. And uh, I think you have the strongest contrast between Cutter, um, the, the, the series protagonist, and then, of course, on the extreme end of that, you have Winnowill, uh, the closest thing to a completely evil character that we get in the series. Um, but, of course, Rayek is also somewhere on that spectrum as an anti-hero figure and rival for Cutter. Yeah. Uh, he, his reaction is much closer to Winnowill's uh, than it is to cutters, right? So that that question of how how you respond to this idea that, that you were whole, there was this one metaphysical realm at one point. And just as a point of context for Winnowell, who we haven't really mm. uh, introduced yet, but she is one of the gliders you discover later in the Elfquest series, and the gliders were the like, yeah. yeah, yeah, the firstborn of the high ones. Hmm. And they decided just to turn their back on the world of two moons, isolated themselves on this mountain called Blue Mountain, and then tried to recreate the High Ones' art and aesthetic and live in this bubble away from everything. What do you do when you have this idea of Eden? Uh, how do you go about realizing it? Or is that even the question? Should that be a thing? Um you know, this homeland. Is there any going back? Should we go back? That becomes a, a literal, a literal dramatic pinpoint as the as the arc progresses. That spiritual sense and longing for this lost wholeness also goes into some other themes, you know, very much embedded within the Elfquest story of like racial racial purity. One of the main story arcs of ElfQuest involves the love triangle between Lita, Kajar, and Rayek. Of course, the Sun Folk are darker in skin and the Wolf Riders are fairer. And there's that element of the interracial romance between Lita and Cutter that is 
intolerable from Rayek's point of view. He wants to restore the greatness of the high ones. Well, you're talking about racial purity. I think one of the things that's really provocative is the way that Wendy Penny flips the script on us. You know, the darker skin characters, the sun, to, uh, the sun folk, they have um, a, uh, a truer, purer line of descent with the high ones. Right, they are they are closer in line of descent to the high ones. Rick and Lita both have magical powers. Um, they so their their blood is is has a more direct relationship to the original high ones who were magical beings. And then you have the Wolf Riders, who we eventually find out alone among elves, uh, their blood is blended with that of wolves. So there is this there's this fundamental integration that happens in their history that renders them unique amongst elves. And it becomes a great source of, of uh, power and comfort to them rather than a source of separateness and inferiority. So it's a wonderful kind of moment. But what I, I even as a, as a younger person, I remember thinking she's really challenging me to think about myself as other. You know, the, the light skinned characters, the Caucasian looking characters, they're the primitives. You know, they're the, they're the ones who. Uh, who more closely resemble the the primeval elemental savages that you know colonial mythology articulates, right? Alfquest deals with all those themes of evolution and the evolution of the humans, the evolution of the elven species, and who's primitive and who's more advanced. That's when it becomes murky and complicated because uh, the wolf riders they have a more primal connection with the land and and the world and nature. And that doesn't necessarily make them more like primitive or lower or inferior. In fact, in the love triangle, Cutter and Rick, in order to win Lita and win her hand, they have to face these challenges, these trials. And Cutter uh, best Rick. Rick is like envious of Cutter. And he never gets over that. And in that instance, like uh, Cutter, the wolf rider, is like the better one. <laughs> like you said, I do think it fundamentally goes back to that that experience of loss. Uh, he loses Lita. He loses the prospect of becoming her her partner, her mate. He loses. He fails before Cutter, and that's death to to Rayek. It's the thing he fears the most is failure. Yeah. Um, and I think that what the series is continually dealing with through him and through Cutter and and through Winnow Will. Uh, and Lita as well. Lita is is a focal point of this. Often is how do these characters respond to the realization of the fundamental lack of safety and security we have in this earthly plane? Right. I mean, the, the Wolf Riders, you know, that their, their lives are not long because very few of them die of natural causes. You know, they're they're killed by humans. They're killed by by wild animals. Um, you know, they end up dead falling out of trees or trees fall on them, whatever it is. How do you reconcile yourself to the fact that you're fundamentally unsafe? Uh, and you can do everything you can to make yourself safe, but it gets to a point where you're going to lose yourself. Rayek and Winnowill can't help but engage in these patterns of domination and control because of their fundamental fear of being out of control. You know, of 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 uh, what would happen if they weren't needed anymore? What would happen if they were marginalized? What would happen if, you know, they were exposed to danger? Yeah. Um, and that's that's what turns you into a villain in these stories is this will to dominance based on this fear of of being out of control. You look at Winnow Will with the former Lord of the Gliders with Lord Vol. She she controlled him. You know, she treated him as a puppet because she did love him. She was scared of what was going to happen if she didn't have total control over him. Again, I feel like I fundamentally understand that. Yeah. Um, but it, it's again this question of what you do faced with your mortality, faced with the limits of your control. Yeah. You're just, you're just a, a finite being or, I mean... They're not. They're immortal, uh, but you're still you're there's still limits on what you can can and can't accomplish, what you should and shouldn't do. Uh, should we talk about Lita? Yeah, let's talk about Lita. Well, first of all, one of the formative crushes of my childhood. I mean, I when I think about like influential female characters that I had crushes on, Lita stands out. Really fleshed out, sensual character, but but not just someone that you know that that was good looking, right? Again, just a, a rounded 
character with a fascinating story of her own. And so her evolution in, in the series is, uh, is also really central. She's, she's kind of somewhere in between Rayek and Winnowill in a lot of ways. Because she has tremendous power, she's a, a healer with magical abilities. It's, it's made clear at multiple points that Winnowill is kind of her shadow side. Winnowill is what she can become if she doesn't guard that, that aspect of her, her, her personality. Like, you know, it's the, it's the old Spider-Man quote, right? With great power comes great responsibility. And that's one of the, the fundamental lessons that these stories so often teach us. And we see it here as well. Uh, um, but uh, her relationship with Cutter, and again, the idea of racial purity. I mean, one of the stumbling blocks of her relationship is that she initially is kind of disgusted by the idea of pairing with him because of his his more feral makeup and the fact that he we eventually realize he has wolf blood the the wolf riders have wolf blood in their ancestry uh, and so there's this whole idea this barrier based on purity and based on what's proper but also based on control when she does give herself over to him and they do form a love relationship she has to reconcile herself to his mortality lita is immortal um, as someone closer to the high ones, she is an immortal elf. Uh, the wolf riders are not, they age and they die. Um, and yeah, Lita struggles with that. Um, she yeah. has to reconcile herself to that and, and, and let Cutter be with that knowledge. Yeah. She respects his, his independence, his autonomy as she does for all living beings. That's what mm -hmm. really distinguishes her character. Also going into how this series is an adult comic. I had that video about it, but, uh, introduces, you know, very much themes of sex and sexuality. I mean, there are elf tribes or in the elf tribes, uh, they have their own practices, cultural practices around sex and and um, like mating and so forth. And also there's all sorts of different pairings and relationships there. There's very much like a, a practice of polyamory too there, as well as monogamy as well. Elves have this kind of free choice, you know, this kind of free love uh that uh is part of their culture like they are not possessive at all uh well i mean individual elves are possessive individual. but i it, mean you have the same way humans yeah. are. you have rayek who you know and yeah. of course cutter as you well <laughs> yeah yeah i mean you have those emotions there definitely but in terms of actual uh like sexual pairings and partnerships they're not per <laughs> possessive at all there's like um would you call them orgy scenes like well they're these scenes oh, like, there's at least one yeah there's yeah, there's yeah. One yeah i mean they're not gratuitous at all but uh where you have like lita and rayek and cutter in there and lita is with cutter and <laughs> rayek is like sulking in the corner there looking at lita <laughs> and cutter is like oh you should go to him <laughs> And you know, yeah, yeah, and, and so and, and Lita and Rayek they pair up, and then Tavi and Cutter keep each other company. It's like, and it's it's just fine. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and that's another thing introducing um, these uh, themes of um, you know mating and sex into uh, into uh, the story. You know, something too in comics that. Uh, I mean, I can't say it was never introduced or never a theme, but I think it was never explored, at least to this extent, this degree, <laughs> you know. Before well, certainly it was my first experience of a comic bringing yeah. that out. I mean, you know, you don't yeah. find it in the mainstream comics that we were reading. Yeah. Um, and it was it was so formative. Like one of Wendy Penny's stylistic influences is Walt Disney. And there is, you know, you can see, I mean, you can see the influence of Japanese animation, manga, and anime, but you can also see the influence of Disney. And I felt like these comments were sort of like Disney had grown up. Now Disney was grown up and telling adult stories. And it was like, it was like the series kind of grew with me. You know, these were the things I watched when I was little. And here's these sort of similar, really stylized stories, but these are unmistakably adult stories. And there was such a richness about that.
there's such a nice payoff too, you know, particularly when it's exploring this interracial pairing here, mm -hmm. you know, that they have that consummation, very much that sexual consummation too. And mm -hmm. it's very um give the time and space there to recognize that it's such a, a big payoff when it happens. It's like, oh great, you know, it's just not uh, dismissed or let's have it happen off screen. I mean, they, it, like I said, it's not gratuitous, but you know, you do see the elves nude and there's no shame there. There's no judgment. And uh, that was just a breath of fresh air. And to touch on what you said about the influence of Disney and animation on elf quest. And of course I did a video covering the announcement of a new streaming animated series uh, produced by Fox Entertainment and uh, the producer and director of Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. And what are your thoughts about seeing an animated ElfQuest? Because uh, there have been several attempts to bring this to the screen uh, as a film, do some kind of adaptation of it whether animated or live action what are your thoughts about this uh, announcement well i gave a big old thumbs up while you were talking about it just now but i am i am kind of ambivalent and my thoughts are that i'm here for it i i will see it when it comes out i love elf quest i'd love to see them you know do it in a, a really provocative interesting authentic way um but regardless of what it's like I'll be okay with just having the series. You know, I I was thinking about this the other day with ElfQuest, and I'm actually really grateful that right now it's really just a comic. There was never a TV series. There's no action figures. So I think about Bill Watterson and Calvin and Hobbes, for instance, the fact that he could have franchised it. There could have been Calvin and Hobbes t-shirts, Calvin and Hobbes commercials. There could have been a TV series. There could have been this, could have been that. But he said, Calvin and Hobbes is a comic strip, and that's all I want it to be, you know? And I, I'm actually really grateful he did that. So to answer your question, I'm here for it. I will see it. I'm excited. But, you know, this right here, this is all I need. <laughs> I, I feel no lack with this, no inadequacy. Uh, I'm really grateful that Wendy and Richard Peeney came together and made this beautiful thing. It'll be here regardless of how good or how bad the, the new thing is. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, that won't change for me. We've had a number of reboots that have been lackluster of various properties, right? So there's total warrant for being like a little skeptical or cautious. You know, I think uh, the one great instance for me was Lord of the Rings. We, of course, love those movies, right? And I think that's an instance too where like those movies, they haven't uh, tainted or compromised my own enjoyment of the books and i can treat them as two separate things i've been reading elf quest you know since i was a kid <laughs> and uh, i only came to lord of the rings lord of the rings later so i wasn't as attached to those books when mm. i watched lord of the rings you know and i have a great deal of attachment to you know and very personal attachment to elf quest so we'll see all right well this has been our After Hours talk about ElfQuest. We hope you all enjoy it. Um, like the video. Subscribe if you haven't already. Um, stay tuned for more content.